Good to be here today. We always look forward to coming to Kalibaki and I've said it before, I said again, we enjoyed our stay here in Kalibaki, really enjoyed, made so many friends even in the village as well. And it's lovely to be back again uh, tonight. We're going to read from the Word of God. We're reading from Mark's Gospel, chapter 10. Mark's Gospel, chapter 10. And we're going to commence at verse 17. And when Jesus was gone forth into the way, there came one running and kneeled to him and asked him, Good master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. Thou knowest the commandments, do not commit adultery, do not kill, do not steal, do not bear false witness, defraud not, honor thy father and mother. And he answered and said unto him, Master, all these have I observed from my youth. Then Jesus, beholding him, loved him, and said unto him, One thing thou lackest, go thy way, and whatsoever thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven. And come, take up the cross, and follow me. And he was sad at that saying, and went away grieved, for he had great possessions. And Jesus looked round about and said unto the disciples, How hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God? And the disciples were astonished at his words. But Jesus answered again and said unto them, Children, how hard it is for them that trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. They were astonished out of measure, saying among themselves, Who then can be saved? And Jesus looked upon them, said, With men it is impossible, but not with God, for with God all things are possible. May the Lord bless his truth to each and every one of our hearts. As you read through the Gospels, it is interesting to note the number of personal conversations that the Lord Jesus Christ had with individuals. We read about him preaching to the multitude. We read him talking to the disciples. We read him talking to various types of people. And indeed, as you go through the Gospels, you will find that the Lord Jesus Christ, as he involved himself with people, he was very, very clear-cut in the answers to the questions which people gave him. Many different types of questions. And it is one of the most interesting things just to go through all of these conversations that he had with different people. Of course, these things are written in the Gospels for our learning. They're put there in the Gospels not only for information, but they are there as a lesson to each and every one of us tonight. And in our reading, we again have one of those conversations. It is very interesting just to look at who is talking to the Lord. It says here, 
There came one running. Good master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? You'll find in the other gospel records that a picture, a very clear picture is given as to what sort of an individual this is. He's a young man. Not only is he a young man, but he is a very religious young man. And that is commendable. We should not decry that. Here was a young man with a desire to worship God, held a position within the temple. But coupled with that, he was a rich young man. And so as we group them together, we find that here was a person with many commendable attributes, characteristics, youth on his side. Finance was no problem. He was a rich man. He was sincere in his religion, felt in within himself that he was good. And yet, he comes to the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the rich young man. And the question that he asked is this, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? Now let's just stop there for a moment and look at the Lord Jesus Christ, the person that he engages in conversation with. Who is this person? This person, as we know, was the Son of God. This person, the Lord Jesus Christ. But more than that, he was life in its truest meaning. For he said, I am the way, on many occasions, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. And so you see that here's a young man, and his question is, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? The person that he's talking to is the one who is life. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. The first thing that I want to share with you tonight is this, that here was a young man looking for an answer. He's looking for an answer. There's an emptiness within his heart. There's a, a sense of discontentment within his mind. You see, he had all the qualities that we are told today in our present society. He had all the qualities that really meant everything. He was young. He was knowledgeable. He was rich. All of these things. But yet there was something within that told him that he needed an answer to a very important question. What shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? You see, here was a young man who acknowledged that beyond this life, there was an eternity. You see, there are so many today and uh, they live for time. They live for life. They live for pleasure. They live for everything that they feel will bring them happiness and contentment. And they fail to recognize that it is appointed unto man once to die, but after this, the judgment. After this. And this young man would have been acquainted with the Old Testament scriptures. 
would have been acquainted, perhaps even maybe read it in, in the synagogue, about life everlasting. Daniel talks about it. In Daniel chapter 12 and verse 2. And yet there is something there that all of these things that he possessed didn't give him an answer about what's going to happen. How is he going to know? How is he going to be sure of life everlasting? And he said, what shall I do? Maybe I'm talking to somebody tonight. You have all of these qualities that we're talking about that this young man had. You may be young. You may be intelligent. But there's something there that God has placed within us that craves for happiness and assurance of life beyond. And so he looked for an answer. The Lord Jesus Christ gave him an answer. Maybe it wasn't the answer that he thought would come from the Lord Jesus. He tested him. Jesus answered him. He says, you know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. He went down through those. And he answered and said unto him, Master, all of these have I observed from my youth. He was sincere in his answer. No doubt, as he listened to to the Lord Jesus Christ engaged in conversation with him. And the questions that would come into his mind as the Lord was talking to him was, yes, I'm all right. I'm okay. I have observed these from my youth. I am all right. I don't need to do anything. And yet, that question still lurked within his mind and heart. Because all of these things which were commendable did not answer the question. Why? Because they couldn't answer the question. You see, when we come to think about eternal life, when we come to think about life after death, we cannot make preparation for that event by our good works, by our good intentions. Because they leave us with that question, that emptiness within the soul. What shall I do? And you know, there are many people tonight in Northern Ireland. And when you talk to them, they feel that they're good enough. And yet, there's still an emptiness. There's still a searching, which all of this goodness has failed to satisfy or fulfill. We see it every day. We talk to it, talk to people from time to time. And they feel they're good enough. You see, one of the things about this young man was this. He looked for an answer, yes. And he listened to what the Lord had to say to him. So many things that are commendable about this young person. He listened to what the master said. And as the master talked to him, he said, well, I've kept all of these. I'm a good, clean, living person. And that's the danger when we feel that we're good enough. Because, you see, the very starting point is this. We're born in sin. And shaping in iniquity. From the act of birth, from that moment we come into this world, we have a heart, a soul that is dead in trespasses and in sin. 
And the more we try to clean ourselves up and do our best and feel that we're good enough, we cannot do it. Because that soul, that emptiness can only be fulfilled in the Lord Jesus Christ. I was talking to sharing with folk. I was talking to somebody recently, a lady who was in, went to the church that we were in some time ago in Donna And his wife trusted the Lord while we were there, lovely lady, but her husband didn't. He would have come to us occasionally on a special event. But then we lost touch with him after we moved up to Collibaki and whatnot, lost touch for some time. And then recently, I happened to be over in the hospital uh, doing some visitation and uh, I met her. I was talking to her and uh, I asked her about her husband. She says he's in hospital at the moment. Not very well. So I said I would go and see him. And I went to talk with him and had a good conversation with him, not having seen him for some time. Read to him the word of God, prayed with him. And I left it at that. I then left it for about a week and went back again to see him. And uh, engaged in a conversation which was maybe different. In a sense, I said to him, Malcolm, tell me, are you saved? Oh, he says, you know, he says, I'm a good person. I'm a very good attender at the church. I don't really need anything else. I think I have enough. My life is good enough. I don't offend anybody. As a matter of fact, he said to me, he said, look, you know, the problem is, he says, and this is, this is, this is terrible. The problem is, he says, they're so and so and so and so and so and they profess salvation, but he says, that's it, I don't want it. I said, look, Malcolm, the issue is not between you, them, and God. The issue is between you and God. You have the problem. It's only God has the answer. And it is between you and God. He was adamant that he was good enough. We read the scripture to him again and we prayed with him. Followed it up by a number of other visits. And then one Sunday morning I was asked to go. He wasn't well. Talked with him and read to him from the scripture. I said, Malcolm, tell me this. Are you good enough? And he says, no. And the words he used were these. I need God's salvation. And we had the joy that morning, Sunday morning, of reading the scriptures and sharing with him that he trusted Christ as Savior. That man was very ill. It must have been maybe six, eight weeks later. He went out into eternity. But he was able to share with his family that he wasn't good enough. But Christ died upon the cross to save him. And if there's somebody in the meeting tonight, I don't know. Maybe you're like this young man. You feel that you're good enough. Of course you listen, like him. You listen to people talking. Here's a thing that fastened itself upon my mind as I read over that story in all of the Gospels that it's mentioned. And it is this. Not only did he look for an answer, not only did he listen to the answer, but he was loved by the Savior. How do you know? Because it says so. Jesus, beholding him, loved him. Dear friends, tonight, this is the core of the gospel. 
This is the message that transforms the lives of men and women, young people, right across our nation tonight. And it is this, that God so loved the world that he gave his son. And one can almost see the compassion in the eyes and in the voice of the Son of God as he looked at him. He beheld him and he loved him. Have you realized that God loves you? Have you realized personally that Jesus Christ so loved you that he went to the cross, as we said this morning? Tell me, and I want you to answer my question within your own heart tonight. If you feel that you're good enough, if you feel that you do not need anything else, if you feel tonight that your goodness and your manner of life as such you've done nobody any harm if that is sufficient why did Jesus die why did God send his son to this world why did the Lord go to Calvary as the hymn writer put it bearing shame and scoffing rude in my place in your place, condemned, he stood. This young man, he, loved, he, he looked for an answer, he listened to the answer. He was loved by the Savior. But then, something else we learned from the story. He lacked one thing. One thing thou lackest. Go thy way, sell whatsoever thou hast, give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven. And come, take up the cross and follow me. You see, someone said to me one time, well, there you are. The Lord was saying, you know, send your money, give your money. That's good, good works. You've got to read the whole story. You've got to read the whole verse. Because what the Lord Jesus Christ was doing was this. He was putting his finger on one thing that was lacking in his life. There was an idol there. There was something there that was taking the place of the Lord Jesus Christ coming into his life. And the answer is given very, 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 very quickly. He had great possessions. You see, what the, what the Savior was doing was this. You've got to follow me. You've got to lay aside the thing that's keeping you back. The thing that you put more importance upon. The thing that you cherish most. You are putting your, 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 your whole dependence on those things. And you're not willing to give it up in order to have eternal life. I you know that can be repeated time and time and time again. Individuals lacking one thing. It, could, it can be so many things. There's no point in going to try and enumerate. But I suppose the question is this that I ask in this meeting is this. If you haven't committed your life to Christ, what is it? What is that one thing that you're not prepared to give up? What is that one thing that's keeping you back from committing your life to Jesus Christ? And in doing so, you become a possessor of eternal life. Life down here on earth. But life in the great eternity. Life in the presence 
of God. He loved his idol more than the certainty of life everlasting. And as I bring my remarks to conclusion, let me say this. The word of God is very, very clear when it makes a statement. The disciples, they were astonished out of measure, saying, who then can be saved? And the Lord makes it very, very clear. It's those, it wasn't riches, those that trust in riches. Those whose dependence and commitment is to that idol for him riches which he was prepared to hold on to rather take up his cross and follow Christ. Very clear. As we bring our little talk to a conclusion two very simple things that I say and one is this he left Christ sorrowful he walked away he was looking for an answer he was given an answer but he made a choice that there was something more important to him. And he left the presence of Christ, a sorrowful young man. May I say again how often that has happened in many gospel meetings, in many gospel missions, where individuals have listened knowing full well as the Holy Spirit begins to talk, knowing full well they need to be saved. But they're not prepared to give that up. That's holding them back. And that young man left Christ sorrowful. Not only did he leave Christ sorrowful, he lost an opportunity. He lost an opportunity. What an opportunity he had. Talking to the Son of God, who indeed, in essence, is life everlasting. He talked to him. He unburdened his soul. He said, look, what, 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 what am I going to do? What have I to do? He listened. He left. A lost opportunity. Did that young man ever? We don't know. That could have been his last opportunity. I feel within my own soul that that young man had that question going on in his mind for some time. He had listened to the Lord preaching. He had observed what others said. And that question went on and on in his mind until the time came that he confronted the Savior and said, what shall I do? Jesus told him what to do. He said no. And he left did he ever get another opportunity? I don't know. But I wonder tonight, is there somebody here, a good person, a good living person, a person perhaps at times, as you put your head upon the pillow at night, what shall I do? What Do I need to do something? Tonight, God in his mercy has you in this meeting. 
and he's giving you the opportunity. I trust and I pray that you will not, like that young man, turn and walk away from the Savior. Because let me say, that is the only answer that that young man needed. But he turned away. We used to sing many years ago, O Savior, O Sinner, the Savior is calling for you. Long, long has he called you in vain. Called you in joy. Lent his crown to your head. He called you in sorrow and pain. Oh, turn while the Savior is calling. And steer for the harbor bright. For how do you know? But your soul could be drifting over the deadline tonight. Let's pray together. Just let me say that if there's anyone here and you'd like to talk with us, you'd like to ask questions, we are available. Please, please do. Don't lose the opportunity of committing your life to Christ. Father, we thank you for each one gathered here tonight. And Lord, you know every heart. You know the turmoil perhaps in hearts tonight. What will I do? What shall I do? Oh God, we pray that the Holy Spirit will bring that conviction and that concern to fruition tonight. May someone tonight trust the Savior. Part us, Lord, in thy fear after we sing our closing hymn. Lord, I say part us in your fear because, Lord, we know not. We know not what a day will bring forth. So, O oh God, we thank you for your goodness. In our Savior's name, amen.